لما يا مخلوق آثرت الجحود كنت معدوما فمن أين الوجود آهي الصدفة أم رب الودود آهي الصدفة أم رب الودود قبله في الكون من بعده السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So we continue uh, with the درس on Surah Dukhan the tafsir and the commentary of the Surah Dukhan of the Holy Quran and we were discussing the ayah of the Holy Quran which mentioned about what they, the unbelievers at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the punishment that actually came from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and they wanted Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to remove that punishment and the, the verses start from you know uh, verse 10 when Allah says in Surah Dukhan then wait you for the day when the sky will bring forth a visible smoke meaning when the punishment will come and they will say our Lord remove the what, torment from us really we shall become believers and then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala he mentions that when the punishment came to them that they were struck so much with that punishment that they actually made dua and they said oh Allah if you remove this punishment then we will become believers so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in response to that response to that he said that how can there be for them an admonition yani how would they learn a lesson and take an admonition from that and accept Islam when a messenger explaining things clearly has already come to them when Allah has sent a messenger when a messenger of Allah in the form of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam came to them and preached for a long while but notwithstanding his long stay with them they turned away and that is what is mentioned in verse 14 they turned away from him and said he is the one who actually has been taught by a human being and he is a mad, mad man. So therefore, the last, in the last uh, uh, dars, the last uh, week we uh, conducted the dars, we mentioned about those verses of the Holy Quran that refuted these two allegations they made against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the, the gist of what we have discussed so far in the, these ayahs is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala struck them with a punishment, a punishment which caused them to suffer. And they suffered to the extent that they came, they swallowed their pride, and they came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Oh Muhammad, pray to your Lord to remove this punishment, we will accept Islam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was rahmatul lil alameen, a mercy to mankind, he raised his hands and he made dua to Allah, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed the drought and the famine from them. And it is about that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Holy Quran, he says, verily we shall remove the torment for a while, verily you will revert. So this was in response to the, the, what they were promising and they were saying that if Allah removes the punishment, then they will, they will believe, they will accept Islam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to tell them verily we shall remove the torment for a while. We will remove the punishment from them for a while, just for a short while. But then Allah says verily you will revert. But means that when we actually, Allah is saying when he removes the punishment, they would not believe. All the promises that they made, you know, and they came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying that if the punishment goes, they will become believers and accept Islam. Allah is saying, no, you would revert. You will go back to their old ways. You will go back to your old ways and you will commit shirk with Allah. This is only a promise you are making. You know, just like many people make promises when they are going through sufferings and they are going through calamities and they are going through difficulties and hardships. And when they actually realize that there is no one to help them but Allah, that at that time they make a lot of promises and they, they make promises to Allah and they make promises to other people also you know as for Allah they, they say to Allah in their du'as and supplication oh Allah if you remove this then we'll better ourselves we'll become better believers we'll begin to worship you we'll begin to do actions and as for other people they will say you know I'm promising you that you make du'a for me and you supplicate to Allah for me that if Allah removes this distress and this uh, hardship or suffering from me I will become a better person so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he hears them, but he also knows that, that many of those people who make such promises would not change. 
they will go back to their old ways. And this is the case here. When they were suffering with that drought and famine, and actually there was no water, and they were really going through a tough time, nothing to eat. The, the earth will not produce. You know, they will be actually eating skins and carcasses, and they will be eating even bones from the ground. You know, whatever they could get their hands on. If When they open their eyes to each other, they will see nothing but smoke on account of the empty stomachs and the starvation. You know, they, they used to see that, that sign like it was smoke. And this is Allah, what Allah says. We will, we will place that upon them as a punishment. So Allah says, we will remove the, the, the punishment for a short while. Not for a long time. And then what will happen? When we remove, it, remove that punishment, you would not accept Islam. You will not come to the path of truth. But you will go back to your kufr and you will go back to your shirk. So as it is mentioned here in this verse, Allah mentions that he will remove the punishment from them for a short while. However, they will renege on their promise and go back to the shirk which they were upon. <laughs> that they will actually go back. They will uh, fail to keep their promise. You know, they will not uh, actually, you know, um, fulfill that promise, but they will go back on their words. Imam Ar-Razi says that in this verse, Allah notifies the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the unbelievers will not fulfill their promise, but they will return to shirk after they get help from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Imam Razi says that in this verse, Allah notifies the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the unbelievers will not fulfill their promise. But they will return to shirk after they get help from Allah. Their conduct was that whenever they were in a difficult situation and were suffering, they would earnestly return to Allah for help. However, when the difficulties were removed or when difficulties were removed, they turned to kufr and shirk, that is, they turned to disbelief and they turned to polytheism, committing shirk with Allah, and went back to the, the ways of their forefathers, which was nothing but shirk. <clears throat> commit shirk, committing shirk with Allah. That's why Imam Razi uh, explained in this ayah, the great commentator of the Holy Quran in his kitab, Tafsir al-Kabir, he mentions that. It further states, while explaining the situation of drought, which came to the Quraysh of Mecca, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala says, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua against the Quraysh on account of their continuous disobedience, Allah accepted his supplication and afflicted them with a severe drought. Matters worsened to the extent that they were forced to eat carrion and bones in order to survive. Hunger and starvation took a severe toll on them to the extent that they would see smoke in the sky. When they started to suffer in this manner, some of them came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and pleaded with him to supplicate to Allah to remove the punishment. This was their situation. Getting back to what we had discussed before, that their, their continuous disobedience and their mockery to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they would just not listen. Whatever they demanded from a miracle, it was shown to them. Questions they asked to test the ability of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to see if he was a prophet, he answered everything because revelation kept on coming to him. But notwithstanding all of that, they just blocked their minds. They just, they were not ready to listen. They were not, they were not ready to change their ways. They clinged on and attached themselves to their old ways and the ways of their forefathers. And they would not budge from that. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made dua to Allah, you know, so that he will inflict a trial or a test or a fitna or an azab on them and it came upon them and when they were actually going through this period of that punishment they they could not bear it they started to suffer and they actually they came back to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and pleaded with him to, to beg allah to remove the punishment upon this request the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam supplicated to Allah and the rains began to fall. Subhanallah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was merciful and although he encountered all these problems from them, their curse, their abuse, their insult, you know, whatever, whatever they did, he encountered all of that. But when they asked him to make dua to Allah, 
he actually had a lot of rahmah, compassion and mercy in his heart. And he turned to Allah and he begged Allah to remove the punishment. And the rains immediately started to fall. The drought had ended, but the Quraysh of Makkah did not believe in the Prophet wasallam. They broke the promise which they made and remained firmly on shirk. They remained firmly on shirk. They broke the promise because <clears throat> they made a promise to him also that if he, 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 he begs Allah to remove the punishment, then they will accept Islam and they will accept him as a messenger. But when the punishment was removed and they saw that the rain started to fall and everything actually became normal, Subhanallah, they forgot all their promises. Just that's human tendency. You know, when you, you see that hardship and suffering, you see that it goes away. You forget all the promises that you had once upon a time made and all the, uh, the words you, were, you had given and, and, and what you would do and, and, and all those things. You forget about all of that. And so too, they went back and they remained for more. And shirk is about this. Allah revealed the eye and says, Verily, we shall remove the torment for a while. Allah says, we'll remove it, but not forever, for a short while. Verily, you, the unbelievers, will return to disbelief. Meaning that although they made a promise, when the, the punishment actually is removed, they would not accept Islam. They would not accept the message of the Prophet wasallam. They will go back and they will uh, continue upon the path that they were on. As it is mentioned in the famous and uh, renowned Tafsir, Tafsir al madhari Surah Dukhan further states in verse 16, On the day when we shall seize you with the greatest grasp or the greatest seizure. On the day, Allah says, so you will go back to Kufr. We will put that, uh, we will remove it for a while and you will go back to Kufr. But do not think that that's the end. The most severe punishment will come to you. So don't think that you have actually fooled somebody or you have gotten away with, 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 with you know, you're not fulfilling the promise. Allah says, on the day when we shall seize you with the greatest grasp, we shall seize you with the greatest seizure, verily we will exact retribution. Yani we will take revenge, we will take retribution for you, from you for what you have done, you have made a promise and you have not kept the promise. Then Allah says, on that day, we will actually exact retribution, we'll take retribution from you. Here Allah warns the unbelievers and says to them that on a fixed day, He will seize them with a grievous punishment, which will be a retribution for what they did. So what did they do? When the punishment came to them and they started to suffer, it affected them. And you know what they said? Let's go to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and beg him to pray to Allah and promise him that we'll accept Islam. So they did that. And they begged him to remove the punishment and they begged Allah to remove the punishment, promising him and promising Allah that they will accept Islam. Lo and behold, Allah accepted the dua and the supplication of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah ended the punishment and he started to send the rains and they all became happy. But they did not keep their promise. They forgot about all of that. They just continued on their evil and sinful ways. Allah says, for that, we will exact retribution. We will take you to task for that which you have done. On that day, it will be the biggest, greatest seizure and the biggest grasping and seizing of you. And this is what Allah says on the day. When we shall seize you with the greatest grasp and the greatest seizure, verily we will exact retribution. And the purpose of seizing them with a terrible punishment on that day, it will be to actually exact retribution for what they did. While explaining this verse, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala stated that the great terrible seizure or the greatest grasp was the punishment which came to the unbelievers of the Quraysh in the battle of Badr where they suffered a disgraceful punishment from Allah. Abdullah bin Mas'ud says that when Allah says, on the day when we shall seize you with the greatest grasp, what day is Allah speaking about? What day is Allah speaking about? Abdullah bin Masood, uh, great companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, great faqih and jurist and scholar, 
from among the Sahabas and a great Mufassir of the Quran, he says that this day which Allah speaks about, that on the day when we shall seize you with the greatest grasp or a greatest seizure, it refers to the day of Badr. That Allah says we will exact retribution on a given day. When is that given day? The day of Bad Badr. Where these people who fought against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who were the same Quraysh, who actually broke their promise to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and their promise to Allah, they suffered a humiliation. They suffered a bitter disaster. They suffered a bitter defeat. And actually, they were humiliated in the worst manner in the Battle of Badr. And Abdullah bin Masood says, this is that day which Allah speaks about on that day when we shall seize you with the greatest seizure or grasp. Yani on that day, Allah seized them with his punishment. This opinion that on that day, that day refers to the day when the battle of Badr was fought, is also the opinion of Ubay bin Ka'ab radiallahu ta'ala, Mujahid alayhi rahmah from among the Tabi'in scholars, al dahaq other great commentator, and one opinion of Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah. This is one opinion of Abdullah bin Abbas. Some commentators have stated that the great seizure or the greatest grasp which Allah mentions about it in that verse 16, mentioned in the verse, refers to the punishment of the hellfire, the fire of hell, which will come about on the day of judgment. This is another commentary. That when Allah says, on that day we will exact retribution and we will seize you with uh, the greatest grasping and the greatest grasp and greatest seizure, it refers to the day of judgment when Allah will throw them in the fire of hell and Allah will... Uh, Put upon them the, the most, uh, uh, the severest or the severest punishment. So they say that day on the day when we will seize you, it refers to the day of judgment, when they will be caught with the fire of hell. And this is the opinion of Hassan, Hassan Basri, alayhi rahmah, the great uh, uh, Tabi'i scholar, Ikrima also. The, and the one opinion of Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah. So we see that two famous opinions are actually given regarding this verse of, that's verse 16 of Surah Dukhan, when Allah says to the, the, the unbelievers from among the, the Quraysh, those people who did not accept the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he says, on that day we will seize you with a terrible a seizure. We will seize you and we will punish you uh, with a terrible punishment. That's, what day is that? Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala and other companions they say it refers to the day of Badr when they suffered a humiliating defeat and disaster. Abdullah bin Abbas, although Abdullah bin Abbas has one opinion with that also, but uh, another of his opinion with some of the Tabi scholars says that it refers to the day of judgment. So both uh, commentaries are given. Some exegetes, yani expert commentators, have reconciled between the two, both commentaries given above. They have made tatbik and reconciled, yani they have joined both to get you know, um, the understanding and have stated that although the punishment to the unbelievers at Badr, in the battle of Badr, was a terrible torment to the unbelievers of the Quraysh, the severe punishment on the day of judgment where the unbelievers will be thrown into the blazing fire of hell is certainly the greatest seizure. So yes, you know, punishment came to them in the battle of Badr. That occurred and everybody witnessed that and they suffered miserably in that. But there is a torment that is more grave than that, that will come up on the day of judgment. And it is possible that Allah refers to that also. Hence, the verse can refer to both punishments as it is mentioned in Safu at tafasir by Alama Sabuni, that yes, it came here, just like some people, because of their wrongdoings, they get the punishment here. But that does not mean they will escape the more severe punishment in the hereafter, which will come on the day of judgment. So yes, both will come and both types of punishment came to the people. The unbelievers, the mushrikeen of the Quraysh. Surah Dukhan continues in verse 17 and states, and indeed, we tried before them Fir'aun's people, the people of Pharaoh. When there came to them a noble messenger, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and indeed, we tried before them, yani we tested before them. Who, 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 who are those people that are being spoken about here? 
when Allah says before them, he speaks about the Quraysh. The Quraysh here, because the Quraysh were actually disobeying the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, denying Allah, rejecting the message. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gives them a little incident of what took place in the past between Musa Alayhi Salaam, Prophet Moses and Pharaoh. So that from that they can take a lesson. And they can see clearly when Fir'aun, that's the Pharaoh and his people continued to deny Allah and disobey the messenger Musa Alayhi Salaam, Allah struck them with a terrible punishment that the whole world became aware of and everyone knew about it. So, so too with them. If they continue to adopt the path of the wrongdoers and disobey the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and deny Allah, then the same thing that came to Fir'aun and his people, it will come to them. So this is why Allah mentions this ayah and this incident about Musa alayhi and Fir'aun at this juncture so that it will send a message and it will be an ibra, a lesson for them. So as Allah says, and indeed, we tried before them, we tested before them, that is before the Quraysh of Makkah, Fir'aun's people, the people of Pharaoh. When there came to them a noble messenger, in this verse, the unbelievers, especially those of the Quraysh tribe, who disbelieved in Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and re rejected the message of Islam, they are reminded of what occurred in the past, with Pharaoh and his people so that, so that it can be a lesson for them. They are being reminded now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings an incident to them to show them that, that your conduct, O people, O Quraysh, your conduct is nothing less than the conduct of Pharaoh and his people uh, that actually they had with Musa alayhi salam. The verse explains that long before them, that is long before the Quraysh of Makkah, Allah tested Pharaoh and his people by sending an honorable and noble messenger to them. The test and trial which came to them was one which involved obedience to Allah and the messenger who was sent to them. This was a trial to see if they would be successful by believing in the messenger or would fail that test by disbelieving in the messenger. So Allah said, said and indeed we tried them, we tried before them, Pharaoh's people, that the people of Pharaoh. What was the trial? What was the test? What was the ikhtibar and the ibtila? The messenger that came to them was the trial that came from Allah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the messenger Musa alayhi salam and he sent Musa to Pharaoh and his people. The question now is what they would do and how they would respond to this messenger. Would they respond in a good manner and accept his message and believe in what he was saying, to believe in Allah as one? And to follow the teachings and the guidelines which actually have come from him? Or would they reject him? Would they deny him? Would they turn against him and disbelieve in Allah? It was, it was for them to act. And uh, as it is mentioned here, the verses of the Holy Quran show that they disbelieved in Allah and disobeyed his messenger and so they were destroyed by Allah. That the Prophet came and that was a test. But then what happened and what transpired afterwards, it was nothing but enmity, hatred and kufr on their part. And because of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them. The Prophet who was sent to them was Musa alayhi salam. Because Allah is making mention about uh, people, Pharaoh people. And a noble messenger. Who was this messenger, the noble one? It was Musa alayhi salam. And he was chosen by Allah and granted miracles and strong evidences. A prophet is always given miracle to prove that he is the truthful one. There were many people who believed in Pharaoh and followed his religion and teaching. So Pharaoh had his own people in Egypt and they were known as the Copts, the Copts of Egypt or the Coptic people. You know, they were people who followed the religion of Pharaoh and they were actually uh, Pharaoh uh, followers and they were the people who, who listened and obeyed Pharaoh. And together with them, there were the Bani Israel, the children of the Israel, Israel, Bani Israel, who were held in bondage in Egypt. Pharaoh enslaved them and continued to oppress and torture them. So therefore, there were these two types of people under Pharaoh's rule and control. 
his own people, the Copts. He never oppressed them. They were the elites and the noble people. And they got all the good things from Fir'aun and from the land of Egypt. And also in Egypt were the Bani Israel, the children of Israel, children of Yaqub after a few generations. Fir'aun had enslaved them and made them his slaves. And he called, called them to work night and day while the cops enjoyed the best of life. So both of these people were under there. So Musa on the Fir'aun and Musa alayhi salam came. The Bani Israel had already believed in prophets. They were children of the prophets. You know, but now with being enslaved, they were forced to listen and obey Fir'aun and even bow before Fir'aun. But they were believers. As for the cops, they were not like the Bani, Bani Israel. They followed other things before. They followed the, the religion of the Fir'aun and the religion that the Pharaohs made for them, they followed that. When Musa salam, was selected by Allah to go to Pharaoh or the Fir'aun, he was instructed to deliver the message of Tawheed, that's the oneness of Allah, to him and his people, the cups, and was also commanded to take out the Bani Israel from the enslavement or the slavery of the tyrant Pharaoh. So Musa salam, was given two different jobs. It was not only to preach to Pharaoh and the Coptic people, to preach to them the religion of Tawheed and to preach to them that Allah is one and he has no partners and you must not serve anyone except Allah and you must not worship anyone except Allah and that he was a messenger from Allah. He was given the task to teach them this teaching. But at the same time, Allah sent him to Fir'aun to and to Egypt to take the Bani Israel from bondage, to take them out from slavery, from the slavery and under the grasp and the clutches of Fir'aun and make them free people and carry them to the promised land. So he was given the two tasks to perform. Regarding this, Musa salam said to Fir'aun, so up front Musa salam came to Fir'aun and he told him why he was there and why did he come back to Egypt after he ran away from Egypt. Because we must remember that Musa salam grew up in the royal palace of Pharaoh. Allah made it like that. You know that Musa salam when he was born it happened to be the year that uh, Fir'aun had ordered and had given the order to kill all the male child of the Bani Israel, the Israelites born in that year. And that happened to be the year that Musa salam, was born and the mother of Musa salam, had to hide this little baby and she had to put the baby in the basket and then put the basket on the river Nile and had it with a rope and when the soldiers came she will release it in the river and when they moved away from the house she will put it back. Until when the soldiers came, once the, 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 the basket, she did not tie it. And the basket just kept on drifting and drifting and drifting. The basket with Musa, salam, the little baby in it. And that basket went directly, you know, going on the course of the river Nile. And landed up and ended up directly in front of the palace of uh, Fir'aun. And the wife of Fir'aun saw the baby. She fell in love with that baby. She took the baby and Pharaoh wanted to kill that baby. It was Musa alayhi salam, but the wife pleaded and said, no, who knows, we, this, this child will be of benefit to us. We can even adopt this child as an adopted son. And so Pharaoh agreed. And this little baby who became Prophet Musa alayhi salam grew up in that very palace with a royal family growing up with royalty as like a prince in the palace. And then when he reached of age, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his plan came into actually existence and one thing after the other occurred where Musa salam, had to run away from Egypt and he went to Madian and he met Prophet Shu'ib salam, there and then eventually got married to the daughter of Shu'ib salam, and while coming back, you know, while going uh, through the mountain pass, he was called for Nabuwat. Yani Allah revealed to him, you know, um, from the, the, the Torah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him a Nabi. And now his entire life was changed. And now he was commissioned to go back to that very tyrant ruler, to go back to that same royal palace, 
you know, where he grew up in and facing the same people but with a different message. So he knew Fir'aun and he actually was aware of everything there. So, but he came as a prophet now. And whenever he spoke, he was never scared to speak to Fir'aun. You know, although Fir'aun was the most tyrant person there, Allah gave him that strength, you know, of heart to speak without fear. And so when he came to Fir'aun, he placed his mission up front, as we said, in the very beginning, he told him, saying, restore to me the slaves of Allah, surrender to me, and release to me the slaves of Allah. Who are the slaves of Allah here? The Bani Israel, the children of Israel. Give them to me, hand them over to me. Because Musa was from the Bani Israel. He was not Coptic. And then he said to him, Verily, I am to you a messenger worthy of all trust. I am a messenger from Allah. And I speak on the basis of wahi and revelation that had been revealed to me. I am not speaking on my own account. It's not my own statement. And, and Musa is making this very clear to him. So he's actually telling Fir'aun, believe me, I am speaking the truth. And Fir'aun will know that because remember Musa grew up in his kingdom and he never knew Musa to be one who will lie, who, one who will be dishonest, one who will make up things. So the verse as it is mentioned here, the verse explains that when Musa salam, came to Fir'aun, he immediately told him of his mission and said, deliver to me the slaves of Allah. That is, release the Bani Israel from bondage and punishment and hand them over to me. Release them from being slaves of you and stop punishing them and hand them over to me. This is explained in another verse of the Quran in which Musa salam, said to him, that said to Fir'aun, So let the children of Israel go with us and do not torment them. Yani do not punish them and hand them to us so that we will go and leave this land. Musa salam, then said to Fir'aun, after he said that, what he came for, he said, Verily, I am to you a messenger worthy of trust. I am to you a messenger worthy of trust. In this statement, Musa made it clear to Pharaoh that he was a trustworthy person, that he was a trustworthy person as he spoke on the basis of revelation and it was not his own statement. He did not, he was not the one who made up this statement. Therefore, he, Pharaoh, or Pharaoh, must accept his advice and must not consider him to be a lie. It's very easy for Pharaoh to look at Musa and say to him, you are a liar, you made up this for your own, of your own. Come in here to take away the Bani Israel from me. So Musa salam, said, no, it's not like that. I am a messenger. Allah has sent me as a messenger. And I speak based on what Allah has revealed to me. So I am a trustworthy person. Believe me. So he, it was an indirect message. Don't call me a liar. So Musa salam, further warned Fir'aun and said to Fir'aun, after telling him what he came for, he said, and exalt not yourself against Allah. Exalt not yourself against Allah. In other words, he was saying to Pharaoh, do not become proud. Do not big up yourself. Do not think yourself that you are, you, that you are mighty and you are above Allah. Do not do that. Do not do that. Do not place yourself that you are a person and you become an object of worship now and as you are asking people to worship you and you have exalted yourself to be high above. Musa was admonishing him and he said to him, do not do that. Do not exalt yourself. Allah is the greatest. Truly, I have come to you with a manifest authority and at the same time he says, I have come to you with clear evidences, manifest miracles and evidences. If you want, I will show you what I have. And then other passages of uh, the Quran mentions that Fir'aun said to him, well, show me what you have. And he actually had shown him the miracles that Allah has sent him with. Musa salam, in this verse cautioned Pharaoh and told him that he must not magnify himself through pride and arrogance and consider himself to be high and mighty against Allah. He should not do that. And that was exactly what Fir'aun did. It. The Holy Quran tells us that Fir'aun ordered everybody to bow before him and worship him. Say, Ana rabbukumul ala. I am your Lord, the highest. I am the highest Lord. I am the greatest Lord. So worship me. So Musa alayhi salam told him, he says, do not exalt yourself. 
and do not think you are high and mighty and you have actually, you know, you think you are so high that you have become a God above Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, don't do that. Do that. While explaining the ver this verse, the commentators have stated that do not exalt yourself against Allah means do not rebel against Allah because that is what Firaun did. He was rebelling against Allah. Do not fabricate lies against Allah. He was also fabricating lies against Allah. You know, speaking about Musa making up his own God and then coming to the Bani Israel to tell them that they have a God by this name, etc. It also means do not seek greatness above Allah. Do not make yourself greater than Allah. Do not big up yourself in other words and do not consider yourself to be high and mighty and you are not looking towards Allah as he is the greatest. Do not become arrogant to Allah's obedience and worship. It means do not become too proud and arrogant that you become so big you feel you, you do not have to worship Allah and you think that you do not have to be obedient to Allah. Nobody is absolved from the obedience and the worship of Allah. Every single person, the mightiest angels and the greatest prophets, they all had to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in humility and bow to Allah in full submission and servitude. Nobody was above that. Nobody was above that. They, can be, they, 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 they could be the greatest prophets. Or as I said, the mightiest angels. They all have to humble themselves towards Allah and bow before Him. So, as it is mentioned here, this is also the commentary in the word and exalt not yourself above Allah. After admonishing Pharaoh about his arrogant behavior, because it was an admonition to Fir'aun. Musa is saying, don't big up yourself, in other words. Don't play high and mighty. Do not think that you are the greatest and you are a lord. You are nothing. So after he actually admonished him in this manner, Musa salam informed him that he has been sent to him by Allah with a manifest authority. What is this manifest authority? That is a clear proof and evidence, subhanAllah. So he, he was sent with miracles. So he could prove his truthfulness. And uh, many, many a time he was asked to show something and he did it because he had a manifest authority. Allah sent him with a clear evidence and clear proof that he was indeed a prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator. In this way, Musa salam presented the message of truth to Pharaoh and his people, informing them to humble themselves to Allah and accept him to be their Lord. So it was not, the message was not only to Pharaoh, but the message also was to the people of Pharaoh. You know, Pharaoh was the, 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 the leader, the ruler. He was the Pharaoh, the emperor, whatever name you want to call him. And around him, there were always these big ministers from the Copts, the Coptic people. And the message was also for them, you know, because a Pharaoh will normally consult them on what he has to do and what he wants to do. He also pleaded with Pharaoh to release the children of Israel from bondage and surrender them to him so that they can all leave the land of Egypt. And that is the first thing he said, restore to me the slaves of Allah. So he wanted Pharaoh to hand over the children, but Pharaoh was not ready to do that. Pharaoh did not accept any of these from Musa salam. He did not accept anything when it was connected to belief, about believing in Allah, about believing in uh, the, the, the messenger, that he was a messenger, you know, nothing of that sort. And he was not ready to hand over the word children of Israel and to actually take them out from his bondage and his slavery. And yani slavery meaning that where he enslaved them. He, he did not accept anything, but instead he threatened to stone him and kill him. He threatened to kill uh, <coughs> Musa <alayhi salam. coughs> This threat has been explained by the great exegete Imam Al-Qurtubi who said that after preaching this message to Pharaoh and his people, it seems that they threatened to kill him for what he said, which is mentioned in other verses of the Holy Quran, what they wanted to do with him. It was on account of this Musa salam, said to him, because of the fact that they threatened Musa salam, to punish him, to persecute him, and to, to kill him, to stone him. What did Musa salam, say? And truly, he said to Pharaoh, and truly I seek refuge in my Lord and your Lord, 
lest you stone me or call me a sorcerer or kill me. And truly, I seek refuge in my Lord and your Lord, lest you stone me or call me a sorcerer or kill me. The verse shows that the threats of Hiram did not frighten Musa a.s. <coughs> Instead, he remained fearless and responded to him by saying, And truly, I turn my Lord, I turn to my Lord and your Lord, and I seek his protection from your plot to kill me or cause harm to me. In other words, with all Fir'aun said to him and the threats, Musa a.s. simply said, I turn to Allah for my protection. In other words, he was saying, you can't do me anything. My Lord is Allah, he will protect me. And I ask Allah for protection against what you have said that you will kill me or you will stone me. While explaining the above verse which states, And truly I seek refuge with my Lord and your Lord, lest you should stone me, Hafiz ibn Kathir alayhi rahma stated that regarding the statement, lest you should stone me, he said, Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala and Abu Salih alayhi rahma state, this means stoning with the tongue, which refers to insult and abuse. That I seek refuge in Allah. I beg Allah's protection from your insult and your, abu and your abuse. Qatada, the other great commentator of the Holy Quran from among the Tabi'in says, he states it means stoning with stones, that they actually wanted to pelt him with stones until they will kill him. The verse therefore means that Musa salam supplicated and said, I seek refuge with Allah who created me and you. You know, reminding, reminding Fir'aun that the one I am asking and I'm begging for protection is not only mine, your Lord alone, is your Lord also, is the one who created you. So I seek refuge with Allah who created me and you, lest you cause any harm to me through words or actions. I beg Allah to protect me from whatever you may say to me and from whatever you may do to me. So we have come to the end of today's class here. The verses that actually were prepared for our class today. We'll stop there and inshallah we'll continue next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.